Um, good afternoon. My name is Regina Hopkins, and I'm with the DC Bar Pro Bono Center. And I'd like to welcome you to our webinar th this afternoon about how to handle charitable contributions. Um, you will find a copy of the PowerPoint um, in the um, uh, there's a thing called handouts on the uh, right side of your sc screen in that sort of um, interface with uh, GoToWebinar, and you can open that and download that. Um, in addition, you'll see a chat box where you can type questions and ask me those questions, and I'm happy to answer them through the course of the webinar. Um, it is being recorded so that you can go back and listen to it at a later date if you want to. So. Um, welcome, and uh, we'll get started right now. Um, just a little bit of background about me. I've been with the DC Bar Pro Bono Center almost 11 years. Uh, prior to that, I was the general counsel for Habitat for Humanity, so I've done, been dealing with exempt organizations for uh, about 26 years now, um, and I was a tax lawyer before that, so this is um, this is home turf for me. So uh, with that, we'll we'll get started. So um, today's session, we're going to talk about what is a, a deductible contribution. Um, it's mostly straightforward, but there are a few wrinkles there. We'll talk a little bit about quid pro quo contributions, what they are, and the special rules that deal with them. Uh, we'll talk about the receipt requirements for cash contributions, um, uh, what they are for donations in general, uh, the special rules for larger donations, how to deal with payroll deductions, which in DC, because of the combined federal campaign, is something we have to think about. Um, what happens with unreimbursed expenses? Someone who is a volunteer or a board member uh, expends money out of their pocket on behalf of the organization. What are the rules for that? And then, um, then we'll talk about non-cash contributions, things like household goods, stock, other real and personal property of someone were to, if you were fortunate enough to get a donation of land, or personal property such as computers or office furniture, things like that. And then uh, there are special rules for donation of vehicles. So let's begin by talking about what is a deductible charitable contribution. Um, so what it is, is it's a voluntary. Um, that's the, the first requirement, that it's something that people give you out of choice. And it's made without getting or expecting substantial benefits in return. So it's just something that you you want to do because you feel um, they, someone supports your mission or admires your work, they make that contribution to you. Um, but in order to be um, a, a deductible charitable contribution, it has to be made to a tax qualified 501c3 organization. Um, from t uh, you can go anybody can go on the IRS website. Um, they have what's known as Publication 78. And you can look up the name of an organization to see whether it, in fact, is uh, exempt under the Internal Revenue Code. Um, it is a good thing to do if you're a nonprofit organization to go and look up your status every once in a while. Um, when I was at Habitat for Humanity, we had from time to time chapters that were deleted inadvertently. Um, so we would have to add them back in. Uh, so it's good to just double check maybe once or twice a year to make sure you're still listed. The other thing um, that you want to check is to make sure you're still a public charity. There are special rules with respect to what is known as the private foundations, um, and they are more strict, and they're subject to more regulation. So everybody, to the extent they can, wants to be a public charity. Uh, large, the, a lot of nonprofits are, typical nonprofit will be. Basically, um, in order to be a public charity, it means that you get support. At least a third of your income is from um, the public or through government grants or grants from other nonprofit uh, public charities. So most nonprofits qualify, but you can occasionally lose your public charity status. And so you just want to double check that as well. So um, what's a deductible contribution um, versus a non-deductible contribution? Well, it's deductible if it's made to a religious, charitable, educational, scientific organization or an organization that prevents cruelty to children or animals. Things that are not deductible are contributions to civic leagues or business leagues, 
social or sports clubs, labor unions, social welfare organizations. You'll see that a lot, um, like groups like the Sierra Club, was, which is um, an advocacy organization. Contributions to them are not deductible. Um, and then political groups or candidates. Um, it used to be that uh, po political contributions were deductible, but about 30 years, 40 years ago now, the IRS, um, uh, the Congress took that out of the Internal Revenue Code. The big thing to note is that a contribution is not deductible if uh, to uh, contributions to foreign organizations are not deductible. Uh, there are certain exceptions for gifts to Mexican, Canadian, and Israeli charities. Um, but um, but generally speaking, they aren't. So if you took a mission trip to Haiti and you found this great orphanage in Haiti and you wanted to make a charitable contribution to them, that's um, admirable, but it's not deductible. Um, so you would have to um, uh, you know find a, a U.S. organization that would take it and, and then give it to the, the, the Haitian organization, uh, but you couldn't give it directly to them. Um, you will see, for example, uh, in the U.S., a lot of friends of, like friends of Oxford University, friends of uh, Cambridge University, and those friends of organizations are de designed specifically to cre have a create a U.S. entity which can accept charitable contributions and, and, and have a deduction. So deductible contributions are cash or cash equivalents, such as gift cards. Cash is the best. Um, marketable securities such as stock, um, that's if you're in a position to don that donate stock, that's deductible. Um, unreimbursed out-of-pocket expenses, what we talked about before, you know, the money that you expend on behalf of the charity. Privately held securities, these are uh, uh, businesses that are held by a limited number of individuals. They're not traded on the stock exchange. Those are deductible. From the donor's point of view, the big question is how uh, the value of the privately held securities. From a nonprofit's point of view, the, 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 point is, the question is what do you do with them? You, you can't sell them because they're not, they're, they're a limited market. They're not owned by the general public. So it may not be worthwhile for you to take privately held securities, um, uh, but that's one of them. Uh, real or per tangible personal property, the real property obviously is land. Tangible personal property would be uh, household goods, um, um, uh, com office equipment, computers, things like that. And then there are intangible personal properties such as patents and copyrights. Um, <clears throat> when I was at Habitat, uh, we would get letters from people saying that if we funded the cost of them getting a patent on their invention, they would donate the pro part of the proceeds to us and stuff. We declined the opportunities uh, to do it, but that's one one thing that uh, people can donate. And if it's if it's if it's you know Microsoft Word, it's a good thing, <laughs> but it's usually not. It's usually uh, uh, people who um, have been tooling around in their garage. So what is not deductible? Well, the first thing is the value of time or services, including professional services. So if you have someone who donates um, their legal services to your organization, thank them very much because they're doing it out of the generosity of their heart. They're not getting a tax deduction. It's the same as someone who donates plumbing services or accounting services or PR services. Any services are not deductible. Um, this, there's no ambiguity about this. There's no question about it. The IRS is this is black letter law, as we like to say, meaning there's, it's not open to dispute. That's the rule. Um, in the same vein, don't, um, if someone donates you, to you a, a building, that's great, that's deductible. If they um, donate half of the ownership of a building, so you and the donor are 50-50% owner, owners, again, great, deductible. But donation of what we call partial interest or less than whole interest in the property, such as donated office space or use of a, a, a facility for a gala dinner or something like that, again, they're not deductible. And again, just like donated services, there is no, this has been settled for a long period of time and there really is no wiggle room here. And the reason why the IRS uh, and the Internal Revenue Code 
has these rules is they're basically saying um, uh, to them, you know, uh, the, whether or not someone would have hired you or whether you would have rented this office space or rented this facility and how much they would have paid is too speculative to generate a deduction. If I give you $50, it's clear I've given you $50. Or if I give you a share of stock that's worth $50, it doesn't, you know, and I, I can go and you know, the charity can go and sell it on the exchange and get their fifty dollars. There's no question about that, about the value and whether it was something has a value has transferred and what that value is. But you know, if I donate my time, the re, the chance reason for the deduction you're saying is or office spaces I could have rented it to somebody else or I could have worked for somebody else. Well, you could have but maybe you wouldn't have. And maybe they would have paid you a certain rate, or maybe they would have paid you less. And so the IRS just feels, and the Congress just feels, that there's not enough certainty, unlike cash or property, there's just not enough certainty to justify giving people a deduction. So um, that is why that is the rule, okay? Uh, lobbying expenses or money given for lobbying expenses is not deductible um, because it doesn't, um, as, as we know from the rules on lobbying, it's not uh, considered part of your exempt permission and therefore it's not deductible. Um, the price of raffle, bingo, or lottery tickets are not deductible because the IRS um, uh, believes that you're getting fair value uh, for uh, what you're paying, you're getting the chance to win something great and wonderful like a car or something, uh, uh, you know, a cruise or something like that. And so what you're paying in the, for the raffle ticket is fair value for that chance to win. Uh, bids at silent auctions are not deductible unless it's the, the amount you pay exceeds the value of the item purchased. So if there's a $50 gift card and someone, because they want to support the organization, Pay bid sixty five dollars for the fifty five dollar for the fifty dollar gift card, then that fifteen dollars is deductible. But that's all. Uh, tuition paid to a school or other amounts designated for a specific individual or small group of individuals are not deductible. Uh, you would occasionally see this at banks. You know, people would have a little jar at the bank counter for someone. Um, now you can go to crowdfunding and and see people raising money for a specific individual. Again, that's very commendable of them, but it doesn't generate a tax deduction because you, it's essentially a gift to that individual rather than supporting a charity's mission. And as we mentioned before, if you're a non-501c3 organization, such as a social welfare organization or political action committee, um, uh, it's not deductible. So how much can a donor deduct? Um, there are limits, um, and uh, the first big limit is that in order to claim a deduction, someone has to itemize their, on their taxes. They can't take the standard deduction. They have to complete the Schedule A um, on the tax return in order to claim a deduction. So um, the charitable deduction uh, definitely favors more wealthy individuals, um, more middle, uh, working class or, or others who give money to charity um, generally don't get the benefit of their uh, charitable deduction, um, don't get the benefit of the deduction because they're not itemizing. Uh, deductions for contributions to a public charity cannot exceed 50% of a donor's adjusted gross income. So um, if I uh, have um, $80,000 in adjusted gross income, the most I can deduct is $40,000. Um, if I'm giving to private foundations, it's even less, it's, it's $24,000, as I do the math there. Um, but you can carry it forward for five years so that if I don't, uh, let's suppose I make a, a major contribution in one year, but I can't deduct all of it, I have five years to go forward so I can deduct it. Okay. And then there is a special rule to deal with quid pro quo payments. Um, these are our payments uh, where I give you money and I get something in return. 
Um, and under those rules, I can only deduct the amount by which, by which what I gave you exceeds the fair market value of what you give me in return. Um, so the donor must reduce, reduce the deductible amount by the value of the benefit received even if the benefit was donated to the organization. For example, I pay $65 for a ticket to a church dinner. And the fair market value of the dinner is $25. The amount I can deduct is limited to $40, even if the cost of the dinner was donated to the church. And the reason is the, I, the Internal Revenue Code is looking at it from my perspective. What did I get? Did I really want to donate something? Or uh, was I buying something? And so it was what was it worth to me rather than what it cost the church in this example. So if the dinner is worth $25, then my $65 ticket has, um, is partly in payment of that dinner and partly uh, a deduction. So my, I, my actual charitable deduction is $40. And um, if the amount the donor pays, for example, in a silent auction is less than the fair market value of the goods or services they receive in return, then the donor is not entitled to a deduction. Um, now, um, and there's a question about silent auctions, which hopefully this will answer. If an organization receives a quid pro quo payment from a donor, partly a contribution and partly to pay for goods and services, um, such as a ticket to a fundraising dinner, and the payment receive, exceeds $75, the organization must provide a written disclosure to the donor. Less than $75, it's up to the donor to figure out what are they getting versus what are they uh, paying. Um, you know, um, that the, the Internal Revenue Code figures and the IRS figure, you know, it's, if it's $40 and the dinner's worth $20, we are not going to worry. We're not going to worry about the small stuff. But when it gets to be exceed $75, then we want some more documentation to show that you're actually entitled to the amount you're claiming as a deduction. And the organization must give the donor uh, a written disclosure that informs the donor that the amount of payment that is deductible is limited to the excess of the money received over the value of the goods or services received. So that I first have to tell them that your deduction is limited to how much you paid in excess of what you got in return, and they have to give a good faith estimate of the fair market value of the goods or services. So um, I have to come up with a value of the dinner I'm given, or the concert, or on a case of a silent auction, what I am bidding. Um, sometimes that's easy. For example, if, if the silent auction uh, item is tickets to a Caps game, then you can look at the face amount of the tickets. If it's um, a concert, well, you can see what similar concert, what, what people paid to go to concerts by that particular artist or similar artists. Um, you know, with meals, you know, how much, you know, you look at the, what's, what's the typical dinner, um, for the meal, sometimes they're a little bit a little bit more nebulous, but uh, uh, generally speaking, um, that's the the responsibility of the nonprofit to come up with an estimate of what the value is, um, and it only has to be a good faith estimate. Um, what I would do is I would um, when you're planning the event, um, I would you know document how you come up with an estimate and, and, you know, put something in the file to show this is kind of how you figured it out. Um, you know, some of them are pretty straightforward, you know, but others you may have to sort of, particularly with the dinner, explain, you know, you might go online and get a couple of menus and, and uh, from similar restaurants, like if you're having a fried chicken dinner, what is fried chicken uh, dinner's cost, and, and, and print the menus and stick it in the folder may be a good way of coming up with an estimate. Um, the disclosure may be made at the time of solicitation, for example, when you're first publicizing it or on the ticket itself or someplace, you list what the deductible portion is, or you can send an acknowledgement after the event and then disclose what the value of the um, um, of the uh, the service the goods or services received in return. Um, if it's the payment is $75 or less, um, 
the organization doesn't have to provide the disclosure, but the donor is still subject to the rule. The donor still has to deduct the value of what they get. It's just the onus is on them for figuring it out versus the nonprofit. Um, there is a pe penalty if you fail to disclose um, the, the value of any goods or service received for payment of more than $75. Um, and the penalty is $10 per contribution with a maximum of $5,000 per fundraising event. So if you have a, a, a dinner and uh, 75 people show up you could fit, and you don't give the appropriate disclosure, then you could be looking at a $750 penalty. If you have something even nicer or bigger, like a couple hundred people, you could be looking at more. Um, but there is um, <clears throat> a, a, a cap of $5,000. So that's the good news. Um, if there's a reason why um, you couldn't do it, um, you have reasonable cause, you may be excused, but you assume you're going to pay the penalty if you don't do it. Now, there are exceptions to these rules. Um, uh, basically, um, you don't have to deduct the value of token goods and services, certain membership benefits, and intangible religious benefits. So. Um, token goods and services are benefits given to a donor as part of a fundraising cam campaign uh, such as with public television and in order to be considered token either it has to the fair market value of the benefits does not exceed the lesser of 2% of the donation or $106 or if the donation is $53 or more the items must bear the organization's name or logo, and the items have to be low cost, meaning which they, they cost no more than $10.60 per year. Now, I know what you're thinking. $53, $106, $10.60, those are kind of odd numbers. And that's because they are adjusted every year um, to reflect increases in the cost of living. These are the 2016 numbers. Um, they'll come out in 2017 with a new set of numbers. It's probably not going to adjust very much. Um, like from 2015 to 2016, it went from 105 to 106 dollars. It went from 52 to 53, et cetera. So, um, so that's what. Uh, so, if you give people small items and you can fit into one of these uh, limits, then you don't have to deduct the value of those. In addition, free unordered low-cost articles are also considered to be insubstantial. I don't know about you. But I get a lot of catalog, um, uh, calendars this time of year from environmental organizations, and um, so and they just come to. I've been getting them since September, basically, and so um, you don't have to deduct the value of those calendars because you didn't order them, you didn't request them. Similarly, the return labels or Christmas cards you get in the mail, same thing. So let's explain this. Let's look at this um, in example. Donor A buys a $200 ticket to a fundraising dinner for Charity X. The cost of the dinner to Charity X is $20 per person, but the dinner has a fair market value of $50. At the dinner, the guests receive a goodie bag, which includes a mug, t-shirt, and folding umbrella. The mug and t-shirt have Charity X's logo on them and cost $4 and $5 respectively. The umbrella is plain black, costs $6.50, and has a fair market value of $20. So how much can donor A deduct? Well, the answer is $130, and let's explain how we get there. The first thing you have to do is you have to deduct the fair market value of the dinner, which is $50, because it's the value, not the cost. It was $50, so that gets you down to $150. Um, and then you have to deduct the fair market value of the umbrella, which was $20. And the reason is, although it could have been a low-cost article, it didn't have Charity X's logo on it. It was just a plain black umbrella, so it has to be deducted as well. So 150 minus 20 is how you get to the 130. The T-shirt and mug bear the logo of the charity, and don't and together they cost less than $10.60. So you don't have to count those. Those don't reduce the value of the uh, donation. So um, that's the rule for those types of, um, that's, that's an example of, of this rule in play. Um, intangible religious benefits also don't d d reduce the amount of the, um, 
deduction. Um, the intangible religious benefits include um, any item that's given for exclusively religious purposes that's not sold in a commercial transaction. It might include wine in a religious ceremony. It might have the right to attend to specific religious services. Uh, those are intangible and are, don't reduce the, the deduction. Um, benefits that are not intangible include a course where you get credit towards a recognized degree, travel services, and other consumer goods. And then membership benefits. Um, membership benefits can be quite lush or, or generous um, if your donation is big enough. But what the IRS here is talking about are basic uh, benefits for uh, the general public. So as long as your um, dues are $75 or less, you can receive free or discounted admissions, discounts on purchases, free or discounted um, parking or free or discounted admission to member only events um, provided that they're pretty basic. It can't be a, a, a fabulous dinner, it can't be a, a luxurious cocktail party, it would be something where they had some you know cheese cubes and vegetable crudite and, um, and uh, a cash bar uh, or something like that but you get to see like say an exhibit at a museum the day before it's open to the general public. Those types of things um, aren't substantial enough such that, um, and the, they're available to people at a wide enough scale that they don't reduce the amount of the donation. Okay, let me see. Someone asks, how much is the range, or of, um, how much a range is a low cost item? A low cost item could be anything you want, um, it, as long as it bears the logo. And as long as um, the when you add up all the low cost items, they don't exceed ten dollars and sixty cents. So you give a T-shirt and a mug. You could give the umbrella uh, with the logo on it. Um, you could give, um, and then if with a big enough donation, if someone gives you fifty thousand dollars, then two percent of that is going to be a thousand dollars. And you could give some, or, or well, it would be the two percent of that is a thousand dollars, but a hundred and six dollars. You could give someone a hundred and six dollars worth of stuff, and it would still be a low cost um, item compared to the much larger donation. Um, but generally speaking, it's um, we're talking about logos. Sometimes people have lapel pins, or they might have a, a um, you know, some other like a cap. All of those. It can be anything as long as it bears the logo and it, it, when you add up the value of the low cost items, they don't exceed $10.60. Okay, so acknowledging donations. As a general rule, uh, nonprofits don't have to acknowledge donations um, at all. Uh, with the exception of the quid pro quo, you do not have to acknowledge a donation at all. It's the donor's responsibility to determine the value of their donation and substantiate it with the IRS. Um, you might get in trouble with your donors, but not with the IRS if you don't acknowledge a donation. Um, the donor, but the donor, in order to claim a deduction, has to have some proof of the donation. Um, generally, a bank record, a credit card receipt, or a written acknowledgement from you all that they made the donation, any of those would be sufficient um, in order to get the deduction. Um, but there's an exception. If a donor makes a single donation of $250 or more, the donor must have a contemporaneous written acknowledgement of the donation from the organization. So any donation of $250 or more, the donor cannot claim a deduction unless you send them a written acknowledgement. So that's why if you, because they're important donors, they give you a good chunk of money, you want to make sure that you have acknowledged their donation so they can get the benefit of the deduction. So what does that mean? Contemporaneous means that the donor has the written acknowledgement in hand as of the date he or she files the tax return for the year in which the donation is made, um, or their due date, whichever is earlier. So. Um, uh, so I'm filing my tax return in March. I'm about to sign it and send it off to the IRS. I have to have that acknowledgement in hand. Now, you as a, a nonprofit can do one of two things. You can provide the 
the the the acknowledgement for the donation when the, when it's made. Um, for example, um, you know, I make a donation of two hundred fifty dollars in July. You send me an acknowledgement then, or you can wait till the end of the year and give a statement, not unlike a W two of a donors all the donation donors donations during the year. I tend to make donations, for example, me um, on credit card every month. Um, it just gets charged to my credit card rather than making one larger donation. And at the end of the year, I get a statement from my the couple of organizations I do this to, where they list all of the donations I made during the course of the year. Um, and that's becoming more and more frequent. Um, so if you haven't seen one, you you know I, I was going to show you one, but I messed up. But I apologize. But um, but that's what you can do. You can in fact have that written acknowledgement provided once a year, listing all the donations by that individual during the year, and is, and um, you should provide it by January 31st. So that's something you can do as an alternative way of complying with it. And the, the acknowledgement that you have must contain all of the following language. The name of the organization, the amount of cash contributed, or a description but not the value of any non-cash contribution, and one of the following statements, whichever is applicable. Either that no goods or services were provided by the organization in return for the services, it was not a quid pro quo contribution, to, or it was a quid pro quo contribution, and here's an estimate of the value of the goods and services that were provided in return for the contribution, or that any um, goods or services were intangible religious benefits. So you can do one of those three statements. And if you don't acknowledge this donation in a contemporaneous um, uh, contemporaneously with one, with all these required elements, the donor will not be able to claim a deduction, period. Um, there is a very famous case that the IRS came out with um, and the tax court came out with. There was this couple, they, gained, they donated 30 some odd thousand dollars to their church. They must have, I'm guessing they were tithers. And the church um, sent them a letter that said, the name, uh, thank you uh, on behalf of the XYZ Church, thank you for contributing to us $35,000. Um, we appreciate your support, very truly yours. Um, and so you say, okay, and they went and they claimed it on their tax deduction and they, when they were audited for totally different unrelated reasons, the IRS questioned the donation they gave them that receipt. And the IRS said, that's great, but you don't have one of these three statements. Um, you don't have a statement that no goods or services were provided, or you don't have a statement that they were, but and here's the value, or that the services were only, uh, the benefits were only intangible religious benefits. You don't have one of those, and so therefore we're not going to give you a deduction. And so they went back to the church and said, oh, give us a new receipt. So the, uh, they gave them a new receipt on the behalf of the XYZ Church. Thank you for donating $35,000. No goods or services were provided in return for the contribution. All set, right? No, it was not contemporaneous, meaning they didn't have it in hand at the time they originally filed their um, return. And they appealed it to the tax court, and the tax court said, nope, the IRS is right. This is what the statute requires. You didn't have the receipt in time that contained all the required language, no deduction. So even though they, in fact, donated $35,000, even though in fact the church was a 501c3, and in fact no goods and services were provided in return for the contribution, they could not deduct it and they had to pay an additional $8,000 in income tax. I'm gather, I'm, I bet you they might have uh, been unhappy with the church, so that's why it's important for larger donations that you make sure you give proper receipts. And I have a question. Um, someone asked, is it more appropriate um, uh, to send it at, uh, with each donation or send it at the end of the year? I think it really depends on you. I think for, for me, because I do it every month, um, 
it's probably better, you know, because I do it on my credit card, getting the year-end one is actually more convenient for me and the like. But if I, you're getting a significant donation, you may want to at least do some acknowledgement, even if you give a more formal receipt at the end of the year. I think it's more of a donor management question rather than um, rather than a, um, a, a legal question. Um, now, if you if someone gets through payroll deductions, like say the CFC, they have to and their records include their pay stub or W-2 or some other um, document furnished by the employer or a pledge card. Those are the sufficient documentation. Although contributions of 250 or more are going to require the contemporaneous written acknowledgement, uh, just like any other cash contribution. And the same with unreimbursed expenses. If I, I give a Toys for Tot, I give a toy to Toys for Tot, I can deduct the value of that toy, what I paid for it. Um, I buy office expense, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, we're doing some sort of event, and I buy, go to Staples and buy a bunch of stuff, keep the receipt, I can uh, deduct the value of those goods. I'm hosting a wine and cheese party, um, a fundraiser at uh, my house, and I go and I buy the wine and the cheese. Again, um, those are deductible as long as they are unre uh, un, un, um, un, unreimbursed by the, the nonprofit. Um, so those are all deduct out of pocket expenses are deductible. They're unreimbursed, uh, particularly if they're unreimbursed, they have to be unreimbursed, directly connected to the volunteer activity. Um, they're only incurred because the donor. Um, uh, gave the we're giving the services, and they're not personal living or family expenses. For example, the, you can deduct the cost of a uniform, but only if it's not suited for everyday use. So if you have some sort of program and everybody's supposed to wear a, a khaki shirt and a blue polo, I mean, a khaki pants and a blue polo, because you could wear them anywhere, it wouldn't be deductible, but a candy striper outfit may be. Um, the donor has to maintain records, and if their out-of-pocket expenses are 250 or more, think of the wine and cheese party. Um, again, you would go; the donor would go to the organization and ask for a contemporaneous written acknowledgement that describes the services provided in connection with the out-of-pocket expenses and all the other information. Um, Non-cash contributions; it's the same requirement in terms of substantiation. Um, for donations of 250 or less, you have to have some sort of um, you have to have some sort of way of proving it. Now, in the case of uh, donation of, of, of things like clothing to uh, or um, a, uh, computers or something like that, you're not going to have a bank receipt. You're not going to have a credit card receipt. So you're going to need some acknowledgement from the charity which includes the name of the charity, um, the date and location of the charitable contribution, and a reasonably detailed description of the property. Um, the only exception to this rule is if, there, if you drop something off at a Goodwill box or you know, one of those clothing boxes where people can just drop stuff off, then you don't have to have a receipt. Um, but otherwise, you need a receipt for donations, uh, smaller donations of um, property. Um, but if there are, if you have something between 250 and 500, you have to get that contemporaneous written acknowledgement. Now, acknowledgements of donations of property, let me stress something right here. It is not your responsibility, nor should you as a prudent matter, put a value on the, uh, any donated property given to you. It's the donor's responsibility to establish the value of their gift. You cannot legally, if you say this is worth, this, you know, this um, computer system is worth $500, that's great, but the IRS doesn't care what you think it's worth. Um, it's uh, because you're not an expert and you don't value it. And they are not going to, if the donation is large enough, they'll just ignore your estimate. And it just gets you in the situation if someone's, um, and it has been known to happen, inflates the value of that donation, uh, either unwittingly or unwittingly. Um, it's not your position as a tax exempt organization to sort of back them up. Um, so if someone says, oh, put down, it's worth $500. 
and say, thank, I can't. Just say, you know, our lawyers won't let us. Blame the lawyers <laughs> or the accountants. Just blame your accountants. But basically, if someone gives you five laptops from their business, say thank you for the five laptops. Uh, th thank you for the five Dell laptops, ser uh, series number XYZ. Um, we appreciate your generosity. And then no goods or services are donated, whatever. Don't ever put a value on it. It's not your responsibility. The IRS isn't going to listen to you, but they could get mad at you if they think you're helping to contribute to, to some shady uh, tax deductions. Um, again, um, if there's 250 or more, they have in order for the uh, if the property's worth 250 or more, they must have a written acknowledgement. And in figuring the value of the donation, the donor may combine claimed items for similar donations, such as books or clothing or something. You don't have to put a value on every book. You can just say donated books or donated clothing. Um, now, once uh, a donor claims um, a charitable deduction of over $500, but not, but not over $5,000, um, they have to file a special attachment with their tax return called it Form 8283. Um, and let me just uh, do this just for a second so I can pull it up. I'm going to show it to you. This is what it looks like. This is the Form 8283, non-cash contributions. They, the donor has to file this with their tax return. And if it's 5,000 or less or publicly traded securities, um, you have to uh, put um, the information about the property, like when did you acquire it, how long did you hold it, what's your basis, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it did various information. And on the second part, they have to, if it's large enough, if it's 5,000 or more, they have to have an appraiser fill out this section, um, this section, like the declaration of the appraiser, that it's worth what it is. See, they have to get a professional appraiser. There is one thing that the nonprofit is asked to do, and that is to acknowledge that they received it. So if they give you um, some stock, or they give you donated office furniture or something like that. You run a food pantry and they're giving you donated food. They will have to file this form out and they will come to you and they say, can you complete part four of this, the donor acknowledgement, the donor acknowledgement. And what you're saying is, um, <clears throat> we are a, a 501c3 organization. That's what that means, section 170, meaning we're qualified to receive charitable contributions. And I affirm that um, uh, I received the property and you're signing it. And then there's this other thing called um, this. Um, we, uh, I have not agreed that, that you agree that if you sell the property within three years, um, you will, in fact, report to the IRS the sale on Form 8282. Um, and I'll explain that in a second. So if they get if you get a really large donation, that's great. Congratulations. Uh, the donor has to fill out the 8283, estimating the value of the property. They may even have to get a, an appraisal unless it's um, if it's prop real estate or uh, like I said, furniture or something like that, uh, or it's a, a work of art, something like that. They'll have to get it professionally appraised. Uh, if it's stock, they just have to report the value of the stock. And um, and they will ask you to sign um, the 8283 just to acknowledge you received the property. Um, there is a donor can deduct the fair market value of household items. These include furniture, furnishings, electronics, appliances, linens, and other items. These are not household items, so there are special you know there's a loose a little bit looser rules for household items. These aren't, and these are the ones that are much more likely to require an appraisal. So the basic basic household items, um, that's what the breakdown is. Um, we talked about a little bit about um, gifts of stock, exchange traded stocks, like um, shares in mutual funds, um, stock, bonds. Um, what you do is, in order to, for the donor to figure out the deduction, is they go, um, 
at the time the donation is made, not when the stock is sold by the charity, but when it's made, they look at what the value is as quoted in the newspaper at the average price between the highest and lowest quoted selling prices. And closely uh, held stock is probably going to require an appraisal based on uh, the company's net worth, prospective earnings, and, and dividend paying capacity. Um, okay. So um, you do have to acknowledge the donation on Form 8283. Um, and then if you sell, um, and you should get a copy of the 8283 uh, after you sign it. And if they sell the property, you're going to have to file what's known as an 8282. Basically, um, that's the 8283. We just looked at that. The 8282 basically says, um, I, we sold the property, and this is what we got for it. And what the IRS is looking to do is they'll look at what they claimed as a deduction and what you sold it for in th within the three years. And if there's too much of a discrepancy, they may go back to the donor and say, you said it's worth a million dollars, and they only sold it for 50000 uh, something's wrong here. Um, and so the, it just notifies the IRS that they want to match up those two forms and see if the discrepancy is too much. And if it is, then they may challenge the original deduction. Um, the IRS also wants to know, sometimes, so get around this, donors would sometimes say, I will give you this property, but you have to promise me you won't sell it until after three years so that they, you would never report the sale in 8282, so the potential for them to get audited would not be there. But the IRS now requires you on the 8283 to report whether you agreed not to sell it for three years. So, um, <clears throat> so that if you get a donation and you, they say, well, give it to you, but you can't sell it for three years, you have to tell them that. And so the IRS knows right up front, okay, we're gonna have to look at this one with special scrutiny. Okay. Someone asked, can board members deduct mileage for transportation to and from board meetings? Generally speaking, commuter expenses are not deductible. So if they're just driving a couple of miles um, uh, to a board meeting from home or something like that, generally that's, uh, that may not be deductible. Um, but if they're traveling for some sort of special event or a conference or things like that, that's clearly going to be, mileage would clearly be deductible in those cases. Um, um, but the back and forth to board meetings, I'd have to, I can't say right off the bat, my instinct is probably gonna say, uh, maybe not. Okay. <clears throat> there are certain night times you don't have to file the 8282 if it's, a, a, if it's publicly traded securities, um, if it's a small item valued at 50, 500 or less, and or if it's consumed as part of the organization's charitable mission. Someone gives you laptop computers and you give them to um, uh, beneficiaries of your program as part of your computer access or digital access program, you won't have to do that. Or someone donates a car to you um, and you give it, you fix it up and you give it to your, uh, your clients so that they can get back and forth to work again. Uh, food supplies, medical supplies, all those things uh, would not have to be reported if you, in fact, use them as part of your, your mission. Now, there are special rules for cars, boats, and airplanes. Um, this sort of first started in the 90s, or the early, late 90s, where people started donating cars, um, in particular, um, and uh, people were, uh, there was a lot of, um, well, the IRS would use the, the word abuse. Um, I'm not sure the charities and the donors would, but the IRS felt that people were inflating the value of these cars. A lot of them were barely functioning, and, and the blue book value of the cars would be substantially more than what they could sell them for. And so um, in order to curb that abuse, the IRS enacted, uh, or the Congress enacted special rules um, that deal with car vehicle donations. And um, Basically, if it's less than $250, um, you just claim a deduction just like you were with anything else. You would want some sort of receipt acknowledging that you gave the car to the charity, but, um, but that's all you need. Um, and then if it's between $250 and $500, um, and again, you need the same acknowledgement for any gift above $250. 
um, in terms of no goods or services, this is, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, if the car is claimed to be worth more than $500, there is a special form that the donor must file with their tax returns. It's form 1098C. Oh, it doesn't, it didn't open up, sorry. Um, so we will close that. Close off. Um, there is a special form that you file um, that contains information about the, the car. Um, and again, you need a an acknowledgement from the nonprofit because it's uh, more than 250. But you also have to uh, the 1098C includes value of the car, blue book value, uh, condition issues, and stuff like that to substantiate that it's really worth what you're saying it's worth. And here's a chart. I won't go through all the details, but here's a chart that lists the basic rules. Um, if you sell the if the organization sells the vehicles, you'll get the smaller of the proceeds or the fair market value. If it's um, if the a vehicle is used by the organization, it's the fair market value. If they improve the vehicle and use it as part of their organization, like they either sell it or they may um, uh, give it to a, a, someone as part of their program, you'll get the fair market value. Um, and if they just if they give it to a needy person or sell it again, you'll get the fair market value. The only limitation is if they give it the you give the vehicle and the uh, organization immediately turns around to sell is that there is a potential limitation of your deduction. So those are basically the rules uh, for deductions uh, receding. Um, the, the important thing to keep in mind is that you want the person to donate again, and so you want to get the rules right. Even though you may not have a penalty, you want to get the rules right so that your donors will donate again. Um, and that's the, the critical thing. And then there are a lot of great organizations, I mean, great publications by the IRS. Um, let me see if this one shows up. Uh, okay. There's a great one on substantiation of charitable contributions that the IRS puts out. And what's great is they actually have sample wording in here about your receipts. Um, and they'll summarize some of these rules, but they actually have um, uh, sample wording for your receipts, which is great. Um, and then there is a special guide to vehicle donations also. Very useful if you get vehicle donations um, or for a donor. Um, some people, you know, some organizations regularly solicit them, others don't. And then there's uh, Determining the Value of Donated Property, which is another publication the IRS puts out. It's a little tomier, as you can see. It's 14 pages, pretty dense. But basically, it, it helps you establish the value. And for you, it, it's also maybe a valuable as well, if you like it, for the silent auctions and things like that. It may be helpful for you, for non the nonprofit to determine the value for their quid pro quo contributions. So, with that, let me see if there's any more questions. Um, so, um, it's an important time of the year. Uh, we get a lot of contributions this time of year. Most of them are cash, and they're pretty straightforward. Um, but uh, there are others. You know, when you do get the occasional property, it's important that you do it. And as I said, to be careful about any larger contributions um, so that, um, that you're properly receiving them at least by January 31st so that the, the donor can, in fact, take advantage of the charitable deduction. If for some reason the receiving hasn't been done or you're concerned that your receipt doesn't have the appropriate language, so you sent a receipt to someone who gave you $300 in August, and you look back and you realize, oops, I didn't include the appropriate language. There's still time, uh, like I said, generally by January 31st, to send them a, a, more, uh, a receipt that includes all the appropriate language. And uh, you can uh, then fix it before they run into problems when they go to their accountant. Um, so you may want to pull out your receipts and see what you're saying to make sure it has all the required language. And if it doesn't, uh, in particular, for the uh, people who give you 250 more or more or more than 250, um, you want to go back and double check um, to make sure that um, you don't have to send them a new receipt. Um, and if you do, 
no harm, no foul, as long as you do it um, in a timely manner. So someone asked me if we are recording this webinar, and the answer is yes. Um, we will send you out an evaluation later today. Um, we will also send you a, a link to the recording so that you are able to um, go back and listen to it, or if you came in the middle, um, then you can do that. Um, there are, as I said, on the interface, there, are the hand, there is the handout, so if you haven't down, downloaded them yet, please feel free to do so. And the great thing is that um, when you do that, um, we've, uh, we have a new technology, so you can listen through your computers, but uh, more the point, if you go back, um, the slides will change um, in the same way they did um, uh, uh, to do that. Now, I do have one more question. Someone says, do you think it's important to send a letter that their donations aren't deductible because your organization isn't 501c3 yet? Um, if they're smaller donations and you did not send them a deduction or a letter saying they were deductible, um, then you, you're not required to do it. Um, and the important thing is once you get your 501c3 status, it will be retroactive to the beginning of your existence. So it will essentially make them deductible after the fact. Um, so I would say I mean, you know, I don't know how much, how many donations you're getting, but you may, you may want to do it. But they're probably going to be okay anyway, as long as you file for your charitable status uh, within 27 months of your deduction and uh, of your creation, and it's in fact granted to you, then um, it will be as if you were always exempt. So, thank you so much. Okay. Um, anyway, uh, with that, I think that's the last question. So um, I'd like to say thank you for everybody for uh, being uh, on board. And as I said, you will be getting an um, evaluation later on today. So have a great afternoon.